Oh, Rube, another boring draft night. <laughs> yeah, you know, with this team, nothing nothing should ever surprise you what they do. Um, every year we go through this, and, uh, you know, it makes it fun. Yeah, it was already kind of a crazy night with the one trade, and then there was another trade, and we're going to get into all of it. We'll get into Jordan Davis, what that pick means for the Eagles, and we'll get into A.J. Brown, the big trade. Uh, a lot to get to. It's late. Uh, you're probably listening to this Friday morning. We wanted to make sure you no, guys. No, they had all a, stayed up. They all stayed up. Thursday I appreciate night. that. Well, we wanted to make sure there was a, a, an Eagle Eye podcast for you bright and early on Friday if you wanted to listen to it on your way to work. Uh, with Ruben Frank, I'm Dave Zangara Rube. Uh, where do you want to start here? Because there's a lot to get into. Uh, you want to go chronological or you want to go with the bigger trade first? I think we start with the trade. Well, they're both trades with, uh, with the receiver. I, I just think that's kind of, you know, I mean, that's something that was out of the blue. You yeah, know. It, it was a big surprise. A.J. Brown, uh, it, it's a huge trade. Um, and, and it's, you know, we, we knew the Eagles were involved in trying to get a veteran receiver. They tried the trade for Calvin Ridley. He got suspended. They went after at least Christian Kirk until that price went crazy. You know, the, the numbers for free agent receivers went nuts. So then they make this deal. They traded number 18 overall and 101, which was that late third rounder they got from the Saints deal to get a really good young receiver who then they pay four years, hundred million dollars. Yeah. And the, the trade was contingent on the contract extension and uh, talking to Howie just a few minutes ago. And, you know, he said it kind of came down to the wire. He said it was really tight. And uh, you know, if there's no contract, there's no trade, there's, there's no, um, it just doesn't happen. So, uh, there was a lot going on uh, at once. He he's a really good player. He's had some injuries. He's 24, uh, and you know I think you get for the first time in a long, long time, you have two wide receivers that are legit. And you know this is a team that's struggled to find one legit wide receiver some years. So to have two is uh, an embarrassment of riches. Um, yeah, I looked up his his career yards per game is uh, 69.6, and just to put that in perspective. In, in three years, he's played three years uh, out of uh, Old Miss. Uh, second round pick, he was just a few picks before Miles, I believe, in that 2019 draft. Um, T.O., listen, this is crazy. T.O. averaged 94 yards per game as an Eagle. The next highest in Eagles history is Deshaun at 68.5. So T.O. is the only receiver with more yards per game as an than anybody in Eagles history other than T.O., uh, Mike Quick, 64, Irving Fryer, 64, Macklin, 63, Tommy McDonald, 63, Harold Jackson, 62, and so on. So that kind of puts in perspective what they got here. Um, over the last three years, he has 10 catches of 50 yards or more, most in the NFL during that span, uh, and six more of 40 yards or more. Big play guy, um, good hands, uh, just a really solid player. And kind of guy they just haven't had you know it comes down to I, I was surprised the price was as low as it was uh, a one and a, a one and a three I thought there'd be something else there I thought it might be a one and a two a one and a three and something else uh, and it was the second of their three of, of their two threes uh, 18 picks after the first one so uh, they, they gave up the lesser of the two uh, third round picks uh, and this is why Howie makes these trades to have these assets and you know, and then uses them in, in a, you know, in a really good way um, without the Saints trade, you know, I mean, really without the whole, I mean, everything's just so related, but without all those moves, this doesn't happen. So um, I think they're just so much better on offense right now. I mean, we said it, you can't go into a season with, with Devontae Quez and, and a lot of hope. Hope is not a strategy as somebody once said, was it Einstein? <laughs> Who said that? Uh, Howie Roseman said that a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, and and he's going to make Devontae better. Devontae's going to make him better. When was the last time they had two good receivers? Just good receivers. I mean, it was it was Deshaun and Macklin, like above average. You know, Deshaun and Macklin, and Macklin missed one of those years. They weren't they weren't together all that long. Um, Jalen Hurts is going to have every opportunity uh, to be the playmaker that they hope he is. I mean, there's no excuses now. He's got the receivers. He's got Goddard. Uh, he's got backs that can catch. Uh, he's got an O-line that can protect and uh, go play football. 
Yeah, and they've spent so much time this offseason talking about building around Jalen. What they had wasn't good enough. They needed to add more. So I give them credit for doing it. As far as the price, I mean, they it was – yeah, it's pretty fair. You give up the 18th pick. The amazing thing is they made both of these trades without giving away their two highest day two picks. They right. kept number 51 overall. They kept number 83 overall. A chance to still get some really good players – on Friday, I thought that was probably a really important thing to Howie when he's going through this. Yes, they gave up a lot of picks on Thursday, but they didn't give up those two highest uh, day two picks. And I think that's a big deal. As far as A.J. Brown, he's just a really proven player. You, you know exactly what you're getting, and it, I, it you have to weigh it because it's kind of funny. In that spot with 18, the Titans ended up taking Traylon Burks, who – has been compared to A.J. Brown. So it's right. like, all right, do you take this kid at 18 who might be that good and you get him for really cheap for five years, or do you get the proven commodity and you pay him and you know what you're going to get? It's Look, there's not an easy answer. What I can tell you is they got a really good player and they know he's really good. You don't have to play that waiting game. You don't have to wonder if he's the piece you need. And the price is the price. You know, he – that's that's what it was going to cost. 25 mil average over those four years makes him the fourth highest paid receiver in the league. He won't be that for long. Other contracts will come and they'll, they'll top that. One important thing Howie mentioned was that, and this is true, we've talked about this, you have a quarterback on his rookie deal, it allows you to kind of spread some of that other money out. Think back to Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. That was how they were able to build that team was because they had this cheap quarterback and they were able to put that money elsewhere, and that's kind of what the Eagles are doing right now. Yeah, if the Eagles had a a, a quarterback on a second contract, this deal never happens. Um, you know, if you draft a receiver, obviously he's he's much 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 cheaper. So you know, you, you have to weigh all those things. He's also a risk. I mean, you don't know. You, you might get another Rager. You might get another Devonte. You might get a. Deshaun. You just don't know what you're going to get. With with a veteran, you know what you're going to get, and that's why you, you know you're paying a premium for that. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna catch between sixty and seventy five balls for nine hundred to eleven hundred yards, most likely. And um, yeah, that's that's what that's what guys are are making. I mean, I'd rather have him at twenty five million a year than Christian Kirk at eighteen million a year. He, I mean, he almost seems like a bargain if if the if you're going to compare it to Kirk for eighteen mil, he's a better player. He's twenty four, which is you mentioned it, but I think that bears repeating. He's 24 yeah. years old. He already has 2,000-yard seasons. He would have had a 1,000-yard season last year if he would have stayed healthy. Yeah, and, you know, you, you look at this offense now, and they're just suddenly so much harder to defend. Um, you know, because I think Quez now, you know, can – I think Quez now – you have a really good three now. Mm -hmm. You know, as a two, I just – I don't think he was, you know, I think, look, as a six-round pick, I, you know, you can't complain about the production, what he did last year. It's really impressive. Um, but now, now you got him as a three and a legit one and two, or, you know, really one and one A. I mean, they're, you know, I, I don't I don't know who, one's going to be a different guy each each game, which, again, is another, you know, a, another really good thing. I mean, this is going to make Devontae a lot better. Uh, Nick had some really interesting things to say about that, about how this will help Devontae and, uh, just make the Eagles more, um, uh, you know, more difficult to defend. Uh, but, you know, and then you throw Goddard into the mix, who averaged over 14 yards a catch. So now you have, you know, two legitimate receivers, wide receivers, a legitimate big-time tight end, Pro Bowl caliber, I think. Uh, and, you know, and then Quez, uh, it, this is, you know, th this is more weapons than this team has had in quite some time. Yeah, and and then if you throw the running backs into the mix, Miles Sanders is a pretty good runner. You have Kenny Gainwell, who I think is only going to get better in year two. But I wanted to go back on something it's you just probably. mentioned. Um, what Nick was talking about, what AJ Brown can do for Devonte Smith. He gave a really, I, I thought, insightful comparison to when he was with the Chargers and Keenan Allen. Kind of had a down year in year two because defenses had the tape on him and, and they were able to really key in on him. This is kind of the way they prevent that is yeah, sure. Key in on Devonte and leave AJ Brown single covered and, and let him beat you. And, and I think that it's going to help both of them and it will probably help Devonte's development, not only from the perspective of having a veteran 
in the room who's 24, but having a veteran in the room, but also, you know, defenses are going to have to pick their poison with this offense. Now it all comes down to can Jalen Hurts get them the ball, and, and we certainly have questions about that, but it, we'll know. We'll know for certain. I didn't know for certain based on what he had to work with right. last year in his first year as a starter. You look at the, the depth chart now, and you think, oh, we better know. I mean, he if we don't know after this year, then we're never going to know. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Gainwell because, and I, you know, I don't know what kind of receiver Miles will be. I don't know if he'll ever catch 50 balls like he did as a rookie, but um, you know, Boston Scott can catch the ball. Gainwell, I thought was really, really good catching the ball. What did he have? 30 catches, something, 32. Um, so just, you know, he drops back. He's going to look at the field, and somebody's going to be open. And that wasn't the case last year because they were trying to force feed Jalen Rager. And that just hurts everybody. You know, Jalen Rager was playing 70 snaps a game, catching, you know, a pass every other week for minus two yards. And they were they were predictable. They they when you have a guy in there who's not a weapon, who's not a legitimate NFL wide receiver, it just hamstrings everybody. They're not gonna have that this year. I don't know if Rager will be on the team or not on the roster, uh, but Obviously, now he's not part of the mix. He's not part of the regular rotation. They're, and I'm sure they'll still run a couple gadget plays that'll get half a yard on, but uh, it, it's going to change everything. You know, you, when you have when you're not trying to force the ball to a guy because he's a first round pick, and you're trying to establish him, and you're trying to get something out of him, and you're trying to rationalize picking him, that that's just not the way to run an offense. So. Um, you know, that's another good thing about this trade is bumps him down another spot of the depth chart, maybe off the depth chart. Yeah. And how he tried to mention, you know, because so much of the focus was on Devontae and Goddard as the primary targets now adding AJ Brown to it. He tried to say there are other guys like young guys, developmental guys we like. He's trying to say Rager there. I, it's it's a tough sell. We we know at this point he can't be a focal point of the offense. And look, if. if if he's on the team, and I think he's going to be on the team based on the contract, you couldn't have him out there. You just couldn't. And Zach Pascal, by the way, who we haven't mentioned, all of a sudden that pickup looks much better. Because if they picked up Zach Pascal and said, oh, that, that's fixed, <laughs> move on from that, you know, they tried to sell, sell everyone on that. But we all knew that that wasn't good enough. But now Zach Pascal as a four, that's a pretty darn good for a guy who's had 600 yard seasons. And and you have Quez Watkins who has a 600 yard season as your three and four. That's pretty deep. And if you do have injuries at some point, you're going to be able to get by. Yeah. And, and uh, I think when they, I think we said this on the podcast when they did sign Pascal that getting him, was kind of a, I mean, we, we thought they were going to draft a wide receiver because of Pascal. I mean, if you don't, you know, that, that can't be your big centerpiece wide receiver move. And we kind of knew that. So I thought that was kind of a lock that they were going to draft a wide receiver. But the, the bottom line is they acquired a wide receiver. And um, I think, I think Pascal really kind of telegraphed that, you know, we kind of knew something else had to, because you're not going to go into the season with, with Devante and Rager and Quez and Zach Pascal. I can't, that can't be your, and then say, well, this is the year we're going to find out about our quarterback. Can't do that. Not fair to him. So there was something else that was going to happen. We just didn't know what it was. And, and, and now, you know, and I'll tell you what, Calvin Ridley's a really good player, but th there were, and, and how he showed some restraint in, you know, sticking by the value that they had on other receivers that were available. Uh, it wasn't just Christian Kirk, but there were other guys who, who, you know, got too much money and, you know, 25 million is a lot, but uh, for the player, uh, what is he third or fourth? I guess. Um, I think he's fourth now. Um, fourth. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot for, I mean, he's not, you know, he hasn't been a 1500 yard guy. Uh, but like you said, I mean, he's going to – that number is going to come down. By the beginning of next year, he's going to be like the 17th highest paid wide receiver. By the end of the contract, he'll be demanding a new deal and holding out. So uh, it sounds like a lot, but it's uh, – you know, they have – he how he makes the, the cap work for him, and, and he's an eagle for the next four years. Yeah, and I think so many people are focused on Debo Samuel. And, and what I'll say is, uh, look, he's a great player, um, and he's coming off – an incredible season, a season that we haven't seen A.J. Brown have. But 
I had more questions about Debo replicating that success elsewhere away from Kyle Shanahan than I do about A.J. Brown replicating his success in a different offense in a different city. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, I think Debo would have been fine here. I, you know, I think – He would have been fine, but I, I – I, you're there's no one – I don't think there's anyone in the league better qualified to get more out of him than the structure he had in San Francisco. So you're going to pay for that production where I don't know if he's going to be able to, to replicate that. Yeah. With A.J. Brown, I, I still think there's more there. Like I think he can still get better. No, I, I think that's all true. And – uh, and I think that makes this kind of a safer, safer move than than Debo, who would probably cost you about the same, uh, I guess. Maybe more. Maybe this helps Debo. Maybe because yeah. if you're Debo's agent, you say, "Well, twenty five is the starting point on this contract." I still think Debo is going to be a forty nine er. I just, you know, what what percentage of trades that are rumored never happen? The guy just resigns with his own team. Like, yeah, I mean, I de- but. Whether he stays with the 49ers or goes elsewhere, he's going to get a contract, you'd think. Oh, yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Won't be here. Um, yeah. I don't think how he's going to <laughs> – I think that's probably it. You got anything else on, on A.J. Brown before we move on to the uh, the actual draft pick? And let's move on. Let's move on. So the Eagles are sitting there, and there were no trades in the top ten going off the board. And honestly, early in the, the draft, it wasn't going their way. The first five picks, right? Five or six, five picks are defense. And you're thinking, all right, like these are players that you would hope would get pushed down. You had Derek Stingley go at two. You had Kayvon Thibodeau go at five. Those were the two people I thought would be worth a trade up into the top 10. Right. And they go in the top five. Uh, so you're wondering, like, all right, what's going to happen here? But the Eagles could have stayed at 15 and gotten a really good player. And that wasn't good enough for them. They jumped up in front of the Ravens from 15 to 13. They gave up quite a bit to do it, and they land Jordan Davis. So they gave up 15, 124, which was a fourth rounder, and then two fifth rounders, 162 and 166, to get Jordan Davis. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of picks. Um, fourth round pick. Yeah, Eagles have had terrible, terrible. I just can't draft in the fourth round, so I don't care about that pick. They're better in the fifth round. Well, tell that to 2018. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um got Devontae and Sweat. Yeah. That uh yeah, that's true. Uh but um Howie made an interesting point about the lack of trades early in the draft that usually those blockbuster trades it's so hard to to move into the top ten as far as what you have to give up that generally you don't do that unless it's for a quarterback. And obviously this was not a draft rich in quarterbacks at the top of the draft. So um, I guess Pickett was the only one taken. Malik uh, Willis never got picked. He I is believe. still available. Still available. Well, how he's been known to take quarterbacks in the second round. So who knows? But um, yeah, so that was interesting. Um, you know, and then you start to think, wow, there's there's going to be a wide receiver lining up at 15, you know, because there's no wide receivers. And I guess uh, Drake London, I don't have it in front of me. Would he go eight? Drake eight. London went eight to the Falcons. So he was the only one off the board through the first nine picks. So now you're thinking, there's gonna one of the one of the top receivers is gonna just fall to 15, uh, and then there was a run on him. Yeah, and I honestly thought so. Uh, at nine, the Seahawks took Charles Cross. That was a spot I thought would be a, a prime trade up territory for Howie if Kayvon Thibodeau or Derek Stingley or even Sauce Gardner fell into that range. I thought. That would be a prime trade-up territory for them. And, and I thought maybe there was a chance for Jamison Williams if they wanted to get into that spot. Ultimately, the Seahawks finally get a, a tackle. They say they would take Charles Cross. And then the receivers start going. You had Garrett Wilson at 10. You had Chris Olave. The Saints traded up for Chris Olave, which is – I don't know what the – the Saints have did a lot to get up to take Chris Olave, which a good player, but I, I don't know about all that. And then the Lions traded up. To get Jamison Williams at twelve, How about three straight former Ohio State. Those guys were all teammates at one point. Yeah, and they go 10, 11, and twelve. Brian Brian Hartline should like get get a raise or something. Ohio State uh, wide receivers coach, former NFL player. But yeah, so yeah, from eight to sixteen, and yeah, and then Dotson goes at sixteen. So you had you had what from eight to sixteen? You had five out of those nine players were wide receivers. Yeah. 
Of course, Dots Dots doesn't factor into what we're talking about, but it's just interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so then the Eagles trade up, and and Howie said they didn't know if the Ravens were taking Jordan Davis. They knew the Ravens were taking Jordan Davis, or you don't trade all that to get in front of them. And honestly, when you look at the Ravens and you look at Jordan, like that was just a, a match made in heaven. I, I forever you were thinking we were on on the clock, and I had the over under of Jordan Davis, and I took the under because I figured he's going to the Ravens. He's not getting past the Ravens, and the Eagles knew that. So they wanted him, they traded up, and they got him. From a value perspective, Rube, it's a lot. It's a lot, especially because they could have sat at 15 and gotten a really – they could have gotten Jermaine Johnson at 15. Yeah, um, a little bit of a risky pick. And, uh, you know, I think I think he's – a guy that there's not a real consensus about um, incredible um, physical specimen with some crazy physical traits. Um, but whether he can be a consistent player, I mean, the big question with him is, you know, how much can he play? How, how many downs can he play? Can he, can he be more than just a, a run stuffer? Can he get to the quarterback at all? When you take a guy at 13, you know, you don't want a one dimensional guy who's just, Really, I mean, he, look, he's incredible against the run. I mean, he was, you know, he was as, as good as anybody in the country uh, against the run. But you want, you know, you want more than that. And you know, we talked to uh, Andy Weidel, who said, you know, physically he has it in him to be a guy who can, uh, who can get to the quarterback. Um, he wasn't really asked to do that. I, I don't really, I don't know if I buy that. I mean, he just, you know, what do you have like? Yeah, like four or five sacks. In his yeah, career. I mean, he really wasn't though. They were they were rotating. They had such a good line. Uh, it wasn't even the best interior lineman on that team. I, you know, it's it's a tough deal, and it it, it kind of goes with all the Georgia players, even on that line. I mean, we saw Trayvon Walker go first overall. His numbers don't his stats don't blow you away, right. and it's because they were asking him to do certain things in that defense. And I, I thought Jordan Davis actually, we, we had a chance to speak with him. Uh, through a Zoom call right after, and he brought up uh, the way they asked him to play it took a lot of selflessness because he was doing things that weren't flashy. He was eating double teams that allowed his linebackers and his his uh, safeties to come up and make plays, and all that's true, and it makes it really tough to then project what he can do in the NFL. Uh, all you can do is say, all right, at, at the base level, he's going to be ridiculously good at stopping the run. Yeah. Right. At the at worst, he's a great run stuffer. And look, I, I agree. With, like I wouldn't take a run stuffer at thirteen either. But that's his. That's the absolute floor. That's the minimum. That he's going to be a monster against the run, and the pass rush upside. It, it's tough to figure out, but the athleticism. I, he's literally one of the most athletic players ever. When you look at the size and and the numbers. Yeah, ran a four two, uh, at the <laughs> not quite, but it was still pretty pretty fast. Um, yeah, uh, you know, look, he, he doesn't have to get ten sacks a year, um, but be active, be active on third down. And he you won't. He, he's not going to be a ten sack. Fletcher Cox isn't a ten sack guy. He's worked out all right. He's had ten sacks in a season once. Yeah, and he had nine and a half once, and you know, eight once. But yeah, I mean, he's not Fletcher Cox, but. Um, he could, he might be as good a run stuffer as, as Fletcher Cox. So I think he uh, already like he, he's going to be that good as a run stuffer. I don't have yeah. any any questions about that. It, it's what can he give you outside of that? But I mean, they're going to ask him to basically play the nose in this defense, and, and we saw they didn't really have that position last year. They had a bunch of three techniques. They had a right. you know Fletcher and Javon and and Milton Williams, and I, I'm starting to wonder with this rotation if if we're not going to see Milton on the edge a lot more. That's a question for you know training camp, but if you're rotating Fletcher and, and Hargrave and now Jordan Davis, it, it's going to cut down on Milton Williams' snaps. So I, I wonder if you start to see him play the edge more. And, and honestly, I wonder if we start to see more three-man fronts out of this team because he can play that three-four type of end. And then you have you, you have, finally have a nose, and I mean Reddick certainly kind of you could see him as a three four 
uh, you know, as well. I, I'm, yeah, he's an I'm, outside backer. What's that? Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a three four outside backer for sure. Yeah, I, I could definitely see Gannon using some three four. Um, I, I don't think he's going to. Uh, I certainly don't think he's going to limit himself to to being a, uh, a you know a, a four three guy. Um, that's his nature is to do different things. Um, yeah, I, interesting pick. I, I I'm I'm not sold on it. Um, Kyle Hamilton is out there. Uh, if it was me, I would have taken Kyle Hamilton. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a chance he'd, he'd fall to 14. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he can do so many things for a defense. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how, you know, how, how, how this all plays out. Uh, they've never taken a safety in the first round. I, I guess they just weren't going to do that. Uh, what would you have done? I, I, it's it's a tough deal. I probably would have stayed at 15 knowing I would have gotten either Jordan Davis, Kyle Hamilton, or Jermaine Johnson. But I can't fault them for getting who could be a really special player. And the risk here is, you, you know, I, I don't want to overstate the risk. He's not like a boom-bust prospect. Right. It's not like he's either going to be an all-pro or a bust. I don't think there's a real bust factor here. The only bust factor is that he doesn't develop into a much better pass rusher. Because, like I said, I think the floor is he's still he's still a really good run stuffer, and he'll eat double teams, and he'll free up. He'll do a lot of the dirty work that isn't going to get noticed, and he'll still be a really good player. I, I think he's going to be a really good player. Whether or not he becomes a legitimate, you know, push the pocket, get after the quarterback, get hurries and sacks and QB hits. I don't know. I, I it, it, That's really, really tough to project. It's really hard to project that. And I asked Andy Weidel about it because like, there's not, like, who do you even compare this guy to? I've heard some comparisons. Um, you know, Albert Hainsworth is one that you, I've heard, but there, there really hasn't been a guy like this. So those comps are fun for all of us, but they actually do help a team when they're trying to figure out what this player can be at the next level. And it's really tough to figure out one for this guy. Like you take Mike Patterson was a, was a really solid run. He was a first round pick later, really solid run stuff or didn't, didn't give you anything, you know, in, in pass rush. Uh, whenever he, if he got a sack, he got like one or two a year. It was just, you know, just eff an effort sack or, or, you know, he was the first guy to touch a quarterback when he, fell down or he was the closest guy when a guy ran out of bounds or something. But, um, you know, he, uh, obviously they're, they're, I mean, he, Jordan Davis is a better athlete than Mike Patterson. Um, there's no question yeah, about that. Mike wasn't running the four, seven, eight. I don't know when he returned that fumble in San Francisco, <laughs> it was like nine minutes to get to the end zone. But, um, you know, but that's, I mean, that I'm thinking of that style guy who's going to, you know, just be really good against the run and then not give you that, you know, that, that extra dimension. So um, I thought what Andy Weidel said was interesting. They seem confident. They wouldn't have drafted him at 13 if they didn't think he could give you something in the, in the pass game and play on third down. Yeah. And it's, it's look, it, it there is the projection makes it really tough um, based on his talent. He should have been a top 10 pick. There's a reason he wasn't. Yeah. I, I wonder if it becomes difficult, you know, you look at Georgia's defense and, you know, just how much talent they had on that, in that group this year. And, you know, how do you separate, like, cause they, they play so well together, you know, and, and he talked about that. Yeah. How do you, how do you separate individuals when it, they, they play such a team style defense? I mean, they, they, this is one of the greatest defenses ever assembled in the history of college football. They, I think, they gave up a touchdown at the end of the national championship game that put them over 10 points a game. They would have been the first team ever to allow like single digits per game over a full season. They allowed like 2.4 yards per carry. I mean, some of the numbers are, are unreal. Um, they had five defensemen, defensemen, five defenders go in the first round and N'Kobe Dean wasn't one of them. And if you put, and if you just watched them this year, you would have said, Oh, that N'Kobe Dean is their best player. <laughs> how about that? Um, I'm just looking. Quay Walker went 22. Uh, which what? A lot of people were giving me credit for, which I'll take. That was my 
bold prediction was that he'd be the first linebacker. Yeah, he did say that. Um, Devontae Wyatt, 28, uh, surprised me a little bit. Um, but yeah, just I, it's, I mean, it's an interesting question for, for how I guess later in the weekend, just when, you, when you're looking at that defense and the way they all, they all rotate, they all play together, you know, how do you, you know, does it make it harder to evaluate? It's like if, if there's a guy playing for Toledo who's like head and shoulders above everybody in the Mac, like it's easy to, it's like, well, that guy may, you can see, I don't know, you can see, you, you see yeah, a guy. I, I, honestly, I think the harder part of the evaluation is the specificity of their job description. Right. You know, like he's he's asked to do this one thing. Like Trayvon Walker is the, the greatest example for me because he's super athletic. He was asked to set the edge, and he did it really well, and his numbers weren't great. And, people, and, and you know, Jacksonville was able – look, I wouldn't have made him the first overall pick, but Jacksonville was able to separate it enough to then feel comfortable drafting him because he has all the measurables, he has the athleticism. And, it, yeah, it's – it's it's a it, there you're right they were too good in a way they were so good it makes the evaluation really tricky. You know what else is really tricky? The word specific 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 say it again. Specificity. Specificity. That's <laughs> that that deserves a. If the, if you guys are just listening to this podcast, Rube just held up a giant uh, cardboard <laughs> cutout of me. Oh yeah, just remember, just not not everyone can see us. Yeah, which I might take home so this doesn't happen again. <laughs> Although if I got like, imagine me like driving home and I get pulled over and the cop just sees me next to me in, it's the, in, the, in the passenger seat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was driving at the time. <laughs> when I ran the red light. It wasn't this day, but it was that day. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So what do you make of this first day? It's, it's, you know, it, they ended up basically using six picks on two players, but most of them were later round picks. And like I said earlier, get it. Making sure they kept 51 and 83 is a really big deal. Yeah, and they still have two first-round picks next year. So, you know, that's the, the, they're still there. Um, I think it was a good day, and, and uh, I, I think you make a great point that Jordan Davis might be a risky 13th pick, but he's going to be a good player. I mean, he's going to be – he's not going to be a bust. I'd be shocked if he is. Uh, yeah. I guess it's, it's always possible. You never know, but um, – the, the the absolute minimum that he's going to give you is exceptional run defense. And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, if, whether, he, whether he's a good first round pick. Yeah. But 13, you know, we'll see what, what he develops into. I love the trade. I, I love the, um, uh, the receiver they got. I, I just think, um, yeah, you go from 10 picks to six picks. It's interesting. They had those three first round picks. They ended up not using any of them. Um, by the end of the draft, they, they, what do they have? 15, 16, and uh, um, 19 originally. That's the most Howie thing ever. Yeah. They ended up with none of them. <laughs> so that, yeah, that is, that is Howie. But um, I really like to trade. I, I just think that you're getting a receiver that's a known quantity. Um, and when you're talking about a team that's drafted Freddie Mitchell and Kenny Jackson and Nelly and, and Rager and Jay Jaw, um, not to mention, I mean, there's a whole litany of guys. Um, now you're getting a guy who's, you know, who, who's done it for three years at a, at a really high level. Um, not an elite level, but a very good level. And I, I'm more comfortable with that than uh, as much as I like some of these, these kids coming out, uh, you know what you're getting. And, you know, Jamison Williams, as much as I, and I mean, I, I, he was my pick. I thought they were going to end up with him somehow one way or another. You know, you think about evaluating Jalen Hurts, and you don't have a whole lot of time. You, you have uh, he might miss half that time. You know, he might not be ready till the middle of the season. So, as a receiver, I think the injury wouldn't, you know, wouldn't keep me from picking him because you're going to get him for five years. But from the evaluation of Jalen Hurts part of it, it would ha hamstring them just a little bit. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it, you're right. You can't just look at it in a vacuum. It's would you rather have A.J. Brown, which you gave up 18, 101, plus a giant contract versus, you know, it, most of those top receivers were gone. And uh, the, the Traylon I, – I know some people were high on Traylon Burks. That I, that, I wouldn't have made that pick. I, I think I mentioned before that he was the one guy out of this receiver group that scared me a little bit. 
But, you know, if you were to get a Jamison Williams with that 18th pick or even at 15, I might have been in on that. The problem is these guys went and they got teams traded up to go get them. (laughs) You know, the Saints and the Lions in back to back picks traded up to get the receiver. So you you weren't going to sit at 15 and 18 and, and get one of those guys. Yeah, I mean, the next guy to off the board was Jahan Dotson, who I think 16 was higher than I, I talked about him on the pregame show. I mean, I, I don't think there's any one thing he's the best at in this group, but he's really solid. He's a yeah. really good player. And, you know, he just – I mean, I, a lot of projections had him early in the second round. I think he kind of went where – so they had – you know, he, he was within their range. They could have sat at 15 and gotten him. Um but, uh, you know, a chance to get a veteran who's 24 and has produced the way he has. I, I would feel better about him than really just about any of these rookies. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to pay the $25 million a year, you know, so. Yeah, there's a salary cap. And you have to, you have to factor that into to what you're figuring out. But it, it does make them an immensely better team, immensely better offense. It'll give us a chance to evaluate Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni. That's true. You know, we talked yeah. so much about Jalen, but, you know, Nick last year went so run heavy. He didn't want to go that run heavy. We, we know that from the way the offense looked in the beginning of the year. Right. And he was trying to figure out what they did best, and it ended up being running the ball. We'll get a better sense of who he is as a coach and as a play caller this year, too. Great point. And he talked about that today. It was funny. Like, usually we're the ones that throw stats at him. He threw under us. He's like, hey, we were ranked 25th in the league in pass offense last year. That's not where you want to be. Yeah. I mean, I I was kind of upset because usually I'm the one who's kind of throwing the stats at him, you know. He's used that one before. He knows that one. That's been something that he he's thought about. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, there's no question he doesn't want to be run heavy. Uh, nowhere near last year. And you know, he says all the, you know, hey, we're gonna do whatever it takes to win that week. Come on, this guy loves to throw the ball. He wants to throw the ball. Um, they didn't have receivers last year, and they had a quarterback who was kind of finding his way. And they had an O-line that loves to run block, and it just kind of became what, you know, the best thing they could do. But, you know, the, the thing is, like, if you throw the ball another five to seven times a game, which they should this year, you can still have an effective running game. You can still, you know, and now you're going to be more unpredictable because you're not coming into the game. Like they went into the playoff game, you know, with Tampa. Tampa knew they were going to try to run the ball, and they stopped them. And they, you know, they they crowded the box, and they didn't have an answer. Eagles didn't have an answer. Well, now they should have an answer when teams do that. So um, they're going to be more multiple and more dangerous and more unpredictable, I think. So you look at the Eagles right now. They still have to address the secondary, right? I mean, they have two pretty glaring vacancies in that secondary still. Vacancies? Yeah. I've never heard it put that way. (laughs) Um, Yeah, you know, I had them trading um, out of 18 into the mid-20s and and drafting Trent uh, uh, Trent McDuffie. ended up going 21. Um, Did the Chiefs take him? I don't remember. She's took him, but uh, yeah, uh, you can't, you know, you can't get everything. And I think there'll be, um, there'll be some opportunities in the second round. Uh, I don't know who's going to fall to that 51 might have to do it, do, do it again. <laughs> but, uh, you know, running out of picks though, you know, uh, went from 10 picks to six picks total. Start so, stealing from next year. Yeah. You know, we're training a 2026 20, second round pick <laughs> to go up eight spots. But it's scary. I mean, the secondary, we didn't have a chance to ask Howie about the secondary, but we're sitting here right now with Zach McPherson and Slay, your corners, and Mar- you know, Marcus Epps and and Anthony Harris are your safeties. And that's now I think as you improve your D-line, it's gonna make the secondary better, but it's that's inadequate right now. And uh, again, it, it you can't re- you can't do everything. And I think they address two long-term needs. I mean, Fletcher's not going to be here beyond this coming year. John Hargrave, we, we don't know if he's going to, you know, I, th- I think they'd like to resign him. I think he wants to be here, but is it going to work out? 
I think I got less money to work with now, so uh, I, I don't know. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't have an issue with how they approach today, but um, they better do something in that secondary because it's not very good right now. Yeah. You got anything else before we wrap this up? No, apparently the Sixers won that game, won that series, won the game. We were so wrapped up in the draft. I was kind of looking at the score like every 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, they've run away with it. They're up one, and next thing I knew, they were up 20. Yeah. So they must have had a big third quarter. But, uh, yeah, so I didn't have a whole lot of faith in them, but uh, I'm glad they closed out the series. Yeah, it was a fun night in Philly. It really fun was. Fun. Yeah. It really was. And I'll tell you what, say what you want about Harry, Howie. He's had some huge swings and misses, and he's had some some great days. It's always fun because you never know what the hell's going to happen next. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll be back with you guys throughout the draft. We're going to do a pod uh, after each day concludes. If you enjoy the podcast, please do us a favor. Rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. Leave a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. That's it for Ruba. I'm Dave. We'll talk to you soon. 